And um, if you have not been there, you're going to want to go because it's absolutely fabulous. I have no idea how they can keep it going. I'm just glad we only have a farm to worry about. <laughs> so, I would like to introduce to you, this is Dave, and he's a member of the board of the Northern Ohio Railway Museum. Okay. I'm going to hand out something. I don't want anybody to say anything. One for you. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> background, um, I've been involved with uh, the Northern Ohio Railway Museum for about five or six years. And, and, and a lot of you can relate to it. I, I saw an advertisement in the paper about six years ago that they were looking for conductors. And at my age, that was always on my bucket list. So I said, I think I'll volunteer and see what happened. You know? And like many things in life, uh, you have to take a little chance because when you take that chance, you wind up finding, oh, there's a whole lot to learn. So what I'll share with you tonight is my uh, what I've learned in the past five years. And um, Chuck, who's with me, uh, really knows a lot more about it than I do. So I've asked him to chime in so he's not interrupting if he says something. <laughs> so... Museum presenters. I thought this is a good way to start it, okay? Originally, Blaine uh, Hayes was supposed to come here and make the presentation. And um, through scheduling, we, we decided or, uh, to, that probably it would be better for me to fill in. Um, but I thought it, my analogy is when you go to a museum and you have a docent and you see an exhibit, and you go around, and then your family comes in and they say they would like to go and you get a different docent. And you see the same exhibit, but you see it through the eyes of a different docent. So um, what I would like to point out is that Blaine Hayes is an author and a historian, okay? So he has spent a good portion of his life, he worked for RTA originally, he's written books, um, he really knows a lot about the overall running of the RTA in the Cleveland area. Uh, Paul Davis, who is another presenter, he presented, he's, I just talked to, to Paul about two weeks ago, and he's more of a history buff. He, he kind of looked at, you know, what's the history of that? And he did a lot of research on uh, what, one of the interurbans. The, uh, the, the next one is interesting. Gloria McIntyre is an educator, okay? She, by, by vocation, taught French, okay? But she got very interested in the safety aspect, and that's what her uh, aspect, uh, her interest is. Mine was when I w when I got, went to the museum and started out as a tour guide. Then I wound up being a conductor, and then then one of the the, the folks there asked me if I wanted to learn one of the streetcars. So I wound up being a motorman. So my real focus is as a motorman and as a conductor. And I'm out there every Saturday that we operate, either operating or conducting. So uh, what you're going to see is kind of my view of the world as, as it looks as we see the museum. So I thought an interesting way to start out is a museum is a, a, a not-for-profit not permanent institution in the service of society that researches, collects, conserves, interprets, exhibits, tangible and intangible, okay, heritage. So what I want to start out with is the tangible side, and then we'll move to the other later. So hard work is what makes a dream come true. The reason I'm going to use the word dream is because the museum was founded in 1965. 
and it was founded by three gentlemen, very young gentlemen, who wanted to um, basically collect, restore, exhibit, and operate uh, electric streetcars from the greater northern area, okay? And to give you a sense of the patience that it really took, it was from 1965 to the first year that we operated uh, the streetcar uh, in a public environment, and that was in 2016. So he waited from 1965 all the way to 2016 in order to get that first car operational. Um, and I think what, you know, we'll talk more about it, but th these are the cars that we have. Um, the car in the center is the car that's operational now, that's car 12, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, there are three street car, or two street cars, the two to the to the left, and then the one on the right is a, 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 a vehicle that that's been used to do maintenance. It, it, it's actually self-propelled, and we'll, we'll get into a little bit about that. So railways don't grow on trees, or maybe they do. So one of the things I found out about railroading is nothing is simple, everything is heavy, okay? You know, if you ask somebody for a wrench, you know, it's about three foot long and weighs 50 pounds, okay? So everything about it, but one of the things that's interesting about a railway, okay? And if you talk about railroads, railroads are steam, railways are electric. So everything that we have, that we are, uh, that we use for the public side is uh, all electric, okay? And in order to in make that electric, you have to put an overhead in. So what these what these fo pic uh, pictures are looking at, and one of the ways I'm gonna focus on the tangible side of the museum, is that it takes a lot of hard work in order to make this operational. You not only have to have the track and the ties and the rails, you also have to have the overhead. And what they're doing here is they're setting the poles <coughs> And this was the poles that we were going to actually use to have the uh, uh, trolley car come out of the, the barns. And those are the barns in the back that you saw before. What goes up must stay up. So this, this, one of the things, this, this is Chuck Legree, who is kind of my mentor at the, at the museum. And Basically what it, he did is he actually had to produce the overhead supports that are going to provide <coughs> us the, the ability to put the cable over above the rails. This is the, this is the copper wire that actually powers the streetcar. Um, it's about three eighths, uh, three eighths of an inch mm -hmm. in diameter. Um, the vehicle that you saw on the far right was where we put the reel of wire in. We actually reeled it out, and that's what they're doing, is they're actually connecting it up to the overhead. So do frogs have ears? Um, and we'll talk more about those, but it's kind of like every profession we have in, in, in your business or in, in your avocation, you, oops, you have a kind of a lexicon of terms well, a frog and, uh, and ears, ears are what actually hold that cable up, okay? And a frog is right over, right over here, where the wire changes direction, what, what the frog does is allows you to have that trolley pole track along either this way or this way, depending on which way the rails are set and which way you're intending to go. So, the purpose of all of this is to give you a sense of the museum is, is, is a one person's dream that's actually come true. Like I mentioned, there were, there were three gentlemen who started it. One is still, was still alive when we finally were able to run the first car with, with uh, the public on it. Um, and it took all that time, but it wasn't just saying, I like to do this. It was all of the work that went into that, that, that gives you a sense of um, how difficult it is. The other thing that's interesting about a, a, a railway versus the rail, uh, railroad 
is that steam is powered all under itself, its own power. When you talk about a, 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 an electric um, power, we also have to have the rails bonded. So the circuit is actually completed by coming out of our power station, going down through the vehicle, down through the, through the um, steel uh, wheels, and back on th and the rails, and it completes the circuit. So, so it actually is a complete circuit that goes all the way back to our um, substation. <clears throat> so moving from, from that, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the interurban. And, and, and I'll just read this to you because I think it's an important thing and it, and it relates to uh, what, what I see as the focus, or at least one focus, of, of, of your uh, historical society. And then the interurban electric trains used uh, streetcar tracks in the city, superior avenues, four tracks were crowded with daily traffic. A Cleveland Southwestern Columbus crew unloaded milk at the, the main station at West 98th Street in this undated photograph. So my question would be to you, what do you see about this picture that kind of connects it with, um, with Brunswick? The milk cans. The milk cans. So one of the things that, that I found out as I started to look at you know, where the interurban fit in is that um, one of the, the advantages of the, the interurbans was that they actually uh, transported more than passengers. They were a, an economic a boom to any county that they would go through. So, it, and it was a two-way street. In other words, it was not only that they would pick up the milk from the farmers and bring it in, but they would also bring things back from the city to the farmers. So it really was a, a big change in the way that the societies along the, the uh, interurban line were actually taken care of. So we talked about the lexicon. The, the lexicon, as far as I'm concerned, is, is a good way to try to understand uh, all of the ideas and, and concepts with regard to, to the railway. So the first one is the horse car. Now a horse car is, is a horse-drawn vehicle that rides on rails. And in today's world, we call where we store our street cars, we call it a car barn. Well, the car barn is a carryover of back in the horse car days when they used to keep the horses in the bar that used to pull the trolley car, or that used to pull the horse cars. So a horse car was really kind of the, 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 the parent of the street car. The next thing is we had two vehicles. So here we have the street car and we have the interurban. And those are the, the function of those. A street car runs on the street, no right of way, and basically it is a vehicle that is a circulator. It goes up and down over probably 10 or 12 miles. It picks up people, it drops them off, versus the interurban. The interurban went between cities, so it's interurban, okay? Now, what came through Brunswick was an interurban, okay? There was no streetcar in, in Brunswick, okay? So the interurban comes through. So those are the functions. The trolley car, can, is, is how those two vehicles can get their power. So the trolley, uh, the trolley car could either be an interurban or it could be a streetcar, but it's how the power is delivered through to the vehicle itself. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but it's kind of like that, the, the, the right of way and whether it is on the streets <laughs> Um, it gives a, a definition of, of, of how it operated, and then it also talks long-term on some of the problems that the streetcars ran into when the, the population increased and when the cars increased, it made it more and more difficult for the streetcar to operate in the city streets. When it first started, it was all by itself. Now, the interurban also ran into problems 
but but the but the problems there were more economic problems. It wasn't because they had their own right of way. So the the right of way had to deal with the interurban, the streetcar, and those two are the same. Now rapid transit, we have we have a car there at, at the museum that's operational. For the first about 10 years of its life, it was a streetcar. It operated on the east side and west side of Cleveland. As the um, traffic demands changed, what they actually did is they took that streetcar and turned it into a rapid transit car. And the rapid transit car is more like the interurban, but it just doesn't go as far, okay? So when we think of the rapid transit, we're thinking of the red and, uh, yeah, the red, the blue, and the green lines that are in their operation today. The, the car that we have was actually operational on, on the red line in Cleveland, and really it changed a lot of, of, the, of the dynamics in the car, but basically it was still in operation. It spent the last probably 20 years of its life as a rapid transit car. A trolley pole, the trolley pole is what you'll see at the top of our trolley car, I'll show it to you. The trolley pole is actually an invention, and at the end of that is a wheel, and the wheel is what is tracking on, on the, the, the copper wire that we have. So the trolley is actually that wheel that is, that is either behind the streetcar or the interurban. The other thing I'll show you is we have a car that we first got probably 10, year, 10 or 15 years ago that finally was, became operational, and that uses a pantograph, and I'll show you what that looks like. <coughs> so this is the beginning of it all, and I think it's, it's good to go back. Um, if you look at all of the, the folks in this, you know, they're all rather proud of what they're doing, it was the way people got around. Um, this, this happens to be um, uh, the uh, Superior Street Railway, which was in downtown Cleveland, um, and it, what pre it preceded the, the electric streetcar. So we talked about how they got from one, one <coughs> area to another. Um, remember that they had to have the overhead no matter where they went. So interurbans, if you think about the interurban line, it went from Cleveland, it came to, to all the way to Brunswick and further, and it had to have overhead in order to get through. So all of that overhead had to be there in order for it to operate. And it had to stay functional, which is, uh, which is a, a, um, kind of a, a, a very difficult thing to do. So this is what they look like. So you can tell the cars, this is probably, what, the 20s, something around there. So, so there's, there's the, so there's the trolley pole, there's the trolley, okay. This is the interurban. This has its own right of way because it's riding on the side of the street. It's not competing with traffic. Um, you can see on the other side, this is probably the return, although an interesting fact uh, about the, the line that came to Brunswick, it was only a single line. And the way they control traffic going back and forth were aside areas where, the trip, where they would get off and they would wait until they would, the, the traffic going the other way would pass and they would get back on. So it was, it was um, a one-way track but it had to be controlled so there were uh, a minimal of accidents. To give you a sense of how pervasive interurbans were, up here is the city of Cleveland, okay? And here we can see over here, we got Indiana, it goes up into um, Michigan, comes over to Pennsylvania, goes all the way down to Columbus, to Cincinnati, so it was, it was really the way people got around, and it was um, in a network that was all integrated. 
And here's the good example, okay? Ohio had more interurban mileage than any other state. So we had 2,798 miles of um, just in our state of interurban. Um, and this, it says here about 1,000 miles more today. The interesting fact is that the interstates that we have today in Ohio are only 1,500 miles. So you can see the amount uh, and the scope of this. And this doesn't even include all of the, the individual cities, the streetcar lines. So you had the interurban network, and then, well done. <laughs> you had the interurban network, and that then was linked together, okay? And then the streetcar line would, would connect up with that. And then if you want to take that one step further, that in many cases would hook up with the railroad. So um, you had this integrated network, you could transfer from one to the other, and they were all individual entrepreneurial uh, um, <coughs> um, businesses. There was no state run, the, the, only re, the only way the state got involved is that they would um, sanction a person who wanted to open a streetcar line in a city, and um, th that kind of gets to why I gave you the, the, the little token, and we'll talk more about that. James, I might yes. add one more thing. We're looking at probably in the neighborhood of 1900 to 1930. That's the time frame that we're looking at mm -hmm. when the interurban had its heydays. So this is an excerpt from a local paper, uh, paper. and, and um, this is in 1901, the Cleveland Southwest Interurban came to Brunswick, okay? So this includes the typographical errors from the paper that I, that I got this from. And, and it had oper it operated for 30 years, it brought goods and services to the community, and I thought this was kind of, you know, John Randall, with horse and wagon, transported goods from the inner urban to the post office, and the newfangled baker's bread came to the station each morning in wicker baskets and was sold at the local stores. I think what this shows is that it really changed the whole dynamics in, in local communities, where all of a sudden they were opened up to the goods from, from other communities, which they would never have. They also were given the, the flexibility of traveling to different cities, okay? Um, in a number of the articles that I read with regard to um, the line that's coming down through Brunswick and going down to Worcester, is, is a lot of people would say, oh, w let's go to Chippewa Lakes for the weekend. <laughs> so before that, they couldn't get there, but now the interurban was there, all of a sudden they could uh, go to Chippewa Lake. The other interesting thing is, that it used to be you you went to high school and that was pretty much it. But all of a sudden the interurban came out and now you can go down to the College of Worcester, okay? Or you can go up to one of the schools up in Cleveland. So it, it really expanded the whole social life from what you could do and what you couldn't do. Um, it, it was a, a way of getting around that didn't exist and it, it, what, almost every article I read was it was, it was it, the bands came out and the officials came out, you know, and the babies and the mothers, and I mean, it was, you know, it was, it was a regular to-do because it was coming through. And you can, you can see, here's 1901, okay, that's when it came through. So that's 100, 122 years ago, okay? Now here's the network that I'd like to focus on a little bit. And I'll show you, here's where we are. Here's Cleveland, or, no, never mind. Here's Cleveland, okay, come down. And here we are right here, that's from here, okay? If you were to go down three, you'd come through Seville, which I happen to have come through yesterday because it was in, down to Worcester. And if you come down, what you're gonna find is that the Cleveland Southwestern Columbus went all the way to Worcester. It actually then connected to other parts of the state, but that was a straight run, and um, 
on the schedule, uh, Brunswick was a flag stop. So you weren't, you weren't a full-fledged location, but you got a, if you were a flag, they would stop and pick you up, okay? Also, they would do things, I read an article where they would do things like, um, um, I'd like to get off like three miles down the track, and they would let people off. <laughs> so it was much, it, it wasn't, you had to stay on until you got the Seville. If you wanted to go down a mile, we'll drop you off in a mile. Nice. Much, much, much more personalized, okay? One of the other articles I read, which I really thought is, is that the, um, parents would actually put their children on, unaccompanied, on the streetcar to say, visit grandma or grandpa, okay? <laughs> and they would actually tag the kids with a little, this is Johnny so and so, and he's going to Seville to see his grandparents. And the conductor then would take responsibility oh to see that that young man or young woman would get to their destination. So I mean, it's kind of like, and I'll talk more about the context of the year, but it's kind of, I mean, it, it just was a whole different world and it wasn't that long ago. So here's Brunswick. I thought this was really cool, okay? So here's, okay, this is, this is going right down through the middle, okay? So that's Route 42. This is, this is from about 1901, and there actually was a circle where 303 and um, 42 intersected, okay? So here's that circle. But if you go over here, this is substation. substation. Why did they call it substation? Because of the substation. Because that's where the substations were. And the substations were, we, have, so we, we were fortunate enough to get a donation at the museum to fund a substation for our museum. We used to have a, an old Chrysler engine that we crank up we take the AC, convert it to DC, we put the pole up, and that's how we powered it. That's how we started, okay? So we, we fortunate enough, we got a, a uh, substation that was donated to us, and, that, and, and basically that's how we make major capital improvements, are, are through donations and through grants that different organizations give us. So we have our own power station, and we, we actually get that uh, three, um, 240, um, three phase lines that come in from Ohio Edison, we rectify that down and we regenerate our 600 volts DC from, uh, from that, okay? Um, but this is an interesting one. So here's, here's where the train ran, and as best I could tell, it would come down Laurel Road, okay? There's your farm right there. We can we can see Sam sitting there right here looking. <laughs> okay. okay, but what the reason they came down Laurel? Okay, the, because of the gravel pit. Okay, so this this it, this is a topographical map, which I think is if you if you follow it, see they're going down through the valley. See how? Okay, so this is where they would get gravel. Okay, and I one read I read one article, and it said. Um, there were 30, 30 Italian guys, okay, you, you can get up here and do this. <laughs> 30, 30 Italian guys who would actually live there and they generate the gravel that they would use to, um, um, to secure the road down, downstream. The other thing that was interesting is it was not only a, a way of getting people around and really expanding their horizons, what it also was, it was a big employer because they would employ people to maintain the tracks. They would employ people to maintain the stations. They maintained, you know, they actually hired a, local, a lot of local people to be motormen and to be um, conductors on the line. So it was a boom economically, even though I would imagine it, it was a rather um, severe change in local life when it happened in 1901. Because at that point in time, you know, it was basically an agricultural society, and um, all of a sudden, here's this uh, newfangled thing coming down the line. <laughs> so I just thought this was interesting because I'm not sure exactly how the train or how the how it ran from here. I know that this was a sideline 
to get to the gravel pit. I'm not sure how exactly how it did, uh, how it traveled up, but basically if we look down here, we're going down towards Chippewa Lake, and we're, and we're going, and the next stop would be uh, the city of Medina. We go up this way, the first real stop up here would be uh, probably up in Berea. Um, I didn't see a lot about Strongsville. Um, so, it, so it's right in the middle between the two. If you look at the overall length from Cleveland down to Wooster, it's about 50 miles, 50, 60 miles to get down. So it was a, a rather you know, significant undertaking in order to do this. So here's some Brunswick pictures, okay? So this is, this is the actually what they used to call 42, they used to call it, and correct me if I'm wrong, okay? <laughs> so I'm afraid to say some things. <laughs> so they used to call it South Street. So here's the circle over on this side. <clears throat> Now this is a car that's actually, it says, um, this is famous, yeah, there we go. The famous electric interurban lines, um, cars, cars which run through between Cleveland and Mansfield were a moving, moving, for, a moving force in Brunswick for 30 years. <laughs> so all the articles that I read was they were, they looked at the interurban as something positive happening to their community. It was never looked upon negatively. It was always greeted when they came through. It was an employer. So the interurban was an integral part of the day-to-day -day life, even though it didn't exist in Brunswick until after 1901. So you can see it was kind of, if you look at the overall history line, it's rather late in, in, the, in the development with regard to a rural community, but it's, it started then to really make changes. Um, also, you know, it, one of the things that the conductors and motormen of the time, so you get the motormen up, up here, okay, here's the conductor. They were always pretty spiffy. They would take group pictures together, they had dress uniforms. I mean, it, it was it was it was a very very um, highly thought about career. So it was it was uh, not you had you had to qualify to be a motorman and to be a uh, conductor. Before you go on, as you can see from that car, it sits high. Uh, it has an urban. It can go faster than a streetcar, which is where you would get off at the street level. So they sit up higher, and they usually have a platform that you get off on to uh, rather than actually try to get down out of the doors to the street level. So it just ran um, faster, so they actually raised them. They have more what look like railroad wheels, mm -hmm. but uh, they, they were able to go faster than the city street car. Just yeah. the side. No, it's a no problem. Yeah. yeah, this is this is a. Uh, You'll see this on the streetcar, on our streetcar, we'll show it to you. It, it, this is actually called, by officially, it's called a fender. And it was a, what you'll find is that most of, almost everything about interurbans and streetcars were patented at the time. And we'll talk more about that. But the, um, this probably on an interurban was a cow catcher. On a streetcar, it was really a people catcher. Okay. <laughs> And we'll talk more about that. So, we talked about the museum. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Once again, um, we'll talk about the museum. And what I'd like to talk about is, is what my real forte is, and that is, I think the intangible heritage of the whole idea of putting a streetcar back in operation and once again um, uh, hosting passengers on it. So a streetcar is a lens by which we view America at the turn of the 20th century. So my premise is, and this is this is my conductor spiel, okay? <laughs> so this is what I, this is really, what I enjoy the most about it, and that is, 
if you look at the humble streetcar, it actually sets the stage for where we were in America at, at the turn of the 20th century, okay? And we'll talk about a little bit about that. So the, the, way, I, the, the way I look at it is, oh, this is good, okay. I, I found this on the same map, this is further down, and the reason I thought this was interesting is, okay, so, so you guys are up here, okay? You come down, this is the line that went to Chippewa Lake. So you were close to Chippewa Lake, it was relatively close to where you were, and then what would happen is it would actually go down, and this is the Wooster line that would go all the way down to Wooster. Well, our museum is right here, okay? And what's unique about the museum is that when it was first founded, it was about 30 acres. Over the years, we increased that um, to 52 acres, and in part, we got the right, we purchased the right of way, although there's physically nothing there, and we purchased the right of way on that interurban going all the way back to Chippewa Lake. Now, Chippewa Lake today is going through kind of a rebirth. They want to try to, to make it a destination center. Well, if you look at the maps on how the whole thing plays out, there's a little dot over there that says, maybe that's where the trolley car is gonna come. So our vision, you know, it's kind of like, is that eventually from our museum, we would actually be able to take a trolley car on a two mile ride up, and what a cool way to get back to, to Chippewa Lake, just like they, they did in the old days. So that's, so it, it's kind of interesting. This is, we actually are gonna use part of the right of way uh, and I'll talk more about that. I keep saying that, but it's, I got more to talk about. <laughs> it's, it's, we'll use part of that right of way as a wide turnaround for us as we go into the third phase of our development project. So I break my spiel down into three things. One is the experience, one is the history, one is the technology, and one is music and lyrics, okay? The experience, and I think this is the most important, that's something we can't do here today, so you all gotta come out to the museum to ride on a 100-year-old trolley. What I ask everybody to do, and I always say, especially um, when I look out there and there's a lot of, um, non-young um, people. <laughs> I'll say, you know, it's hard for, as you get older for, to pretend. And what I ask them to do is pretend. Pretend it's 100 years ago. And what was it like? And we'll talk more about that, but if you think about it, it was the roaring 20s, okay? We had just gotten out of the war to end all wars, we thought, okay? Um, Prohibition was in effect, in effect, and this is always this one is always hard for me to believe. Women got the vote, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? It's like 1920. I, it's like, why did it happen so late? It's like, who, who knows? Okay, the flappers were flapping, and the speakeasies were serving. Okay, so I can imagine somebody from Brunswick saying, "Let's go on the interurban, go down to Cleveland, and we'll find a little speakeasy." Right? So I mean, it it, it served a lot of needs even including going to college or, or university, okay? Um, the other thing that it, it was, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a, a time that was being labeled. You know, it was the Roaring Twenties. Um, it was F. Scott Fitzgerald calling it the Jazz Age, you know, the, um, um, talking about the, the times and um, the ukulele was po popular, which <laughs> to, for anybody, Probably they don't even know what a ukulele is, okay? But it was popular and it kind of sets the stage of where we were at if we were 100 years ago. And then the other thing is, is now that we've stepped back 100 years and we're sitting on the seats that everybody has sat on in, in the past, you could be sitting on a seat that your great-great-grandfather sat on or um, a seat that a really, a, a very, very famous person got on. Um, the Am I, am I too long? Okay, okay. Tell me to shut up with it. Okay. <laughs> What'll happen on the trolley, you see if the motorman and the power's going down and I'm starting to talk too long, 
he'll just turn on the compressor and then nobody can hear me and I know that I have to shut up. Okay, so, anyway, so, so turn on the compressor anytime. Uh, so it's the experience and what I ask people to do, they rattan seats, ask them to sit down, relax, feel the breeze coming in, hear the compressor, hear the wheels against the rails. It's all the sights and sounds that everybody felt a hundred years ago. It could be a hundred years ago. So that's really the sense. It's, it, it's, it's not so much learning the facts as much as feeling the feeling of what it was like back then, okay? Um, um, so here we are. This is car 12. Um, this is one of the first times that we were riding. You can see that we're, the, when, especially when the trolley is really full, it really echoes what it was like. Because the, it, it was, that's the way it was when it operated on the city streets. So here's the, an era, okay? And it, I thought it, it's interesting to talk about it as an era because it was a period of time between the wars. And it was a period of time, a very, opti a very optimistic time. You know, we were not going to have another war. You know, women got the vote. Um, prohibition was eventually going to end. We got through the Depression. You know, it was, it was all of those things. The population, which is hard to believe back then, it was 110 million. And that was primarily people east of the Mississippi. And we were going from an agricultural society to an industrial society. So we were going through a lot of changes, uh, both societal and, and, as, an, and as an economy. Um, we're going through electrification, industrialization, immigration, and urbanization. You know, we, we always think we're going through a lot of changes today. I think the 20s and 30s were probably yeah. just jam-packed with stuff going on, okay? Um, my premise is, is that if there was no streetcar, we could have never had the second industrial revolution. Because you needed people, you needed to get them to work, you needed to get them home, you needed to get their families to school and to the grocery store. So if you, if you look at, you know, the steam engine was revolution at one, we were in electricity, computers came along, and we're, we're all, you know, dealing now with, is this gonna be the third one or not, generative uh, artificial intelligence. But it was, it was a period of time when we were moving from an agricultural society to an to a industrial society. The, I was looking, and, and the average um, uh, age uh, uh, from birth was, um, today it's 77, back then it was about 57. So people were not living as long. Um, there's one slide I might not have here, but it's, you know, it's, it was a simpler era, but it was kind of simpler in quotes. It was simpler in one way, but much more complex in another. Um, the, um, the another interesting thing is, like I said, you know, this is the way people got around, and especially when they're younger people, I'll say this is before the car. And it's kind of like, they can't relate to what <laughs> is before the car. But this is how people got around. So if you looked at the average streetcar, we run our car probably max maybe 15 miles, 20 miles an hour. Um, a lot of times, you know, the folks will get on, how come we're going so slow? Well, basically that's how it went. It didn't go very fast. I mean, the joke of the time was you could probably walk faster than you could, you could by taking the trolley. The only difference is, you know, the trolley was heated and on a snowy day in Cleveland, I think you'd prefer to be on the trolley car. Okay, um, but it was people getting on and off, so the the motorman never really gave it the, the full throttle. Basically, what they what we do is we bring it up to us to to get it moving, and then we let it coast, and then we stop because we'd stop every two or three blocks. Okay, so it's not that much different than it would be um, if in fact you were sitting on a trolley car. Uh, the reason I gave what did I give everybody? A <laughs> nickel. Well, okay. The fair was a nickel, and it was regulated by the municipality that you couldn't operate a streetcar in the city and charge anything more than the nickel. So uh, the, the car that we ran actually ran between downtown Cleveland and University Circle, okay? 
That's how University Circle got its name, because it was a turnaround for the trolley car. It would go on the west side, it would go out uh, underneath the Detroit Superior Bridge, it would make a left at West 25th, or right onto Lorraine, and it would shoot out Lorraine, it would go to Cam's Corners. And that's when Cam's Corners was the hinterland. I mean, that was wild, wild west, out of, out of, it's hard to believe, but that's the way it was. Um, and so the, the, the overall fare was limited to a nickel, and if you think about on the east side, it would go down in the area where all the millionaires lived, okay, down Millionaire Mile. And so here's the, um, the chief executive from one of the big companies getting on, pays a nickel. Right behind him is one of the cooks or servants, and they pay a nickel. So I think it, it, one way to look at the, at the whole trolley car experience was it was a great equalizer. Everybody got a seat, there was no first class, it, it, was, it was the way people got around, and so it actually caused people to come together, okay? And, um, it, and, and it was the way to get around. Also, another factor is that um, one of the re cars were becoming cheaper, but the road networks weren't um, expanded enough to, to allow the cars to go any further. A lot, of, a lot of roads ended at state lines, and it was only after the highway acts in the 1940s that we actually connected them together. So you, it wasn't that the car was an alternative, it wasn't so much that it was inexpensive, it just was not as useful as it could be because the road network wasn't there. So this is car 12. This is me in the bow tie. <laughs> so this is what the museum looks like. Uh, basically, there's car barns over there to the right. We have our substation in the back. Um, the, we have about a half a mile of track. And all we have is an oval, so we actually have to back up, which trolley cars are not really built to, tra to back up really easy, so we have to go kind of slow. Um, like I said, we probably average maybe 15 to 20 miles an hour max. There are street cars that have both ends, right. so you can't operate it. That one is certainly one end of the motor one is that one end one. So we actually have two cars that are operational. Uh, this is this is one car 12 built in 1914. It was built by a, a, a company on the east side of Cleveland. It was a German immigrant whose father came over. His two sons, one son decided that instead of doing uh, interior woodwork, that they wanted to start to build horse cars. Horse cars led into street cars, electric street cars, and um, they were one of the major companies in the state of Ohio that actually produced street cars and interurbans for operation. Um, I did a presentation um, for the Society of Automotive, um, or the Society for Automotive Engineers. And basically, they wanted a lot of technical de uh, details. So I thought I'd include those because it, this, the, The streetcar at the time it was built was state of the art. It was the way, it was, there was no better technology in order to provide power <coughs> to a moving vehicle, okay? And that was really, probably if you look at electrification, it was probably one of the most important uses of electrification after the light bulb. Because the issue was, is how do you provide electric, constant electric power to a moving vehicle? And the invention that was done by Carl, um, Frank Sprague was, was exactly that. That little trolley wheel was how they did that. And um, car, 50, uh, car 12, 51 feet long, weighs 50,000 pounds. So much about 15, 16 cars weight. Okay, so it's very heavy. Operated on the streets for 25 years as a rapid transit until 1957. The way we get power is we have 600 volts overhead, that's DC, that's generated from our substation. It comes down and it powers um, four 50 horsepower engines um, that were also patented for, at the time. They're, they're, we have one per axle, 
uh, we have um, low voltage, high traction. So what it is, is we actually uh, dumb down that vo voltage to around 100 volts DC in order to allow us to get traction, steel on steel, and then we actually back off the resistors to reduce, uh, to increase the voltage and allow us to go faster. So it's kind of a counterintuitive operation. The other part of it is, is that it, it's powered by an air compressor. The air compressor is um, the mechanical device that allows us to um, do the pneumatic operations in the car. And that is, in order for us to stop, we have um, first generation air brakes that allow us to do the stopping and the, um, the taking out of the resistors in the circuit. We actually use the compressor, which then uses the electromechanical device to start kicking those resistors out. So the, the, you'll hear the compressor going on and off as we operate because it's trying to constantly keep up to about 75, about between 60 and 70 pounds per square inch is what we need to, to do. And, and, and for, the, for the engineers, that's uh, the four atmospheres, that's okay, which is cool. But the other thing for more of us, it's kind of like, it's the same pressure that when you take that little thing off of your champagne bottle that forces the cork out. That's about, about 70 pounds per square inch. Okay, so that's what we operate on. This is what it looks like. This is um, what the control, what, what they call it is, they call it the vestibule in, in the old days. So the vestibule, and that's where they, the motorman stand. The motorman has to stand up it all the time. So there's no seat for the motorman. They're always standing. If you look on the left, there's the control for the operation. In other words, that's how we go forward and back. That's how we speed it up. Here's the air brake. You do, it's, it, it's not driven like a car. It's actually a combination of trying to give it some um, acceleration, backing off, and then controlling it with the, um, the air brakes. It, it takes a little while to get used to because it's not like your car is where you step on the brake and you stop. And you have to, the, one of the things that Chuck mentioned is, you know, the way they, they um, evaluated the good motorman is that when you stop, not everybody falls off their seat. <laughs> <laughs> So this is, this is, I thought, I put this in because I really think it showed, if anybody's familiar with downtown Cleveland, you know, this is the square, okay? This is Superior Avenue going right across. Wow. Here we go. That's the Renaissance Hotel today, okay? So you can see, look at all, this is people trying to get on and off of the trolley car. There's people walking across here. There's cars across here. You know, it's kind of like, I think probably every motorman probably had high blood pressure. I mean, it's, just, it's kind of like it was really a taxing job. And you can see they have to, you know, this is another, really, only one car can turn at a time because you can see that they actually extend over. So they have to be coordinated. And these cars right here, actually the same vintage cars as we have in the museum. This happened to be a, a, a twosome, but we, we have the same. So, um, <clears throat> so here's, here's my premise too is also that you can tell, um, and, and we can do this here if, if you want, um, um, you can tell a lot about the, the era by listening to the music and, listen, and, and hearing the, the, the lyrics. So this is, this is a um, kind of a, um, a question and answer that I'll do, and that is, uh, there's a song from the, from the movie Meet Me in St. Louis, it's called the, the Trolley Song. And what I thought it was, what was interesting is, it was done by Judy Garland and the MGM uh, Studio Chorus. I mean, how old fashioned does that sound? Right, we don't see that anymore. So, what we normally do is sing, so, I thought, you know, if you look at the words, you know, she's um, talking about herself, high stock, uh, high starch collar and high top boots, talking about the, the person who she sees. 
with the light brown derby and bright green tie. So what we do in there, and we can do it, is I'll sing it first, and then everybody can follow, okay? So it goes clang, 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 went the trolley. Ding, 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 went the bell. Zing, 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 went my heart strings. From the moment I saw him, I fell. So it's actually a love song, okay? So it's Judy Garland sees somebody that she really likes. You know, I'm not sure if a light brown derby and a bright green tie would be a really a taker today, but go ahead. <laughs> it, it says, I started to yin. What's that? Uh, you know, again, is, uh, you know, it's like, um, wish. Like, wish. Like, something wish. you want. Like yeah. something you want. You want. Yeah. Something yeah. you like. Yeah. So, without further ado, one, two, three. Clang, clang, clang with the trolley. Ding, ding, ding with the bell. Zing, zing, zing with my heart strings. From the moment I saw him, I fell. All right. <laughs> Good job. So what I, kind of getting towards the end is, I, I looked at you know a lot of the, the implications that the trolley car had, and we talked about you know, Julian Sprague was all about the trolley. You know, F, um, uh, George Westinghouse Jr. were air brakes. That was his kind of claim to fame. F. Scott Fitzgerald, you know, the great Gatsby and the Jazz Aid was talking about that era, okay? Um, we had, we had the, the struggle between the AC guy and the DC guy, okay? And um, actually, um, AC one long term, but in reality, a good number of the trolleys that are in operation today still use DC. Okay, some are using AC as we go ahead, but it still became a relatively standard as we went through. Um, Tennessee Williams, um, I think this is interesting. Um, uh, in a streetcar named Desire, okay, Tennessee Williams in that tells the whole story about Blanche um, and um, Stella and how Blanche is actually gonna wind up because there's always confusion, you know, where does, where does uh, Blanche go at the end? Is it a good place or a bad place? Well, Tennessee Williams, in telling her how to get, uh, Stella telling her how to get there, tells her to take a streetcar named Desire, change on the cemetery line and get off to Elysian Fields. And Elysian Fields is the um, kind of a Greek uh, uh, place where heroes go. Mm -hmm. So he kind of says in the end that Blanche does go to a better place. That she is, she's a good person, which I, I always think is nice. H.G. Wells, time traveler, we're all time travelers. I think if you, if you sit in a trolley car, you can't help to feel a little more connected to history because so many people have sat in there. Um, I'll tell you this, if I have, I have, there's a story about the Los Angeles Chargers. Do you know the Los Angeles Chargers, where did they come from? New York. New York, right, we're in New York. Brooklyn. Brooklyn, they, they used to be the Brooklyn Dodgers, okay? Well, the, the, the story goes, is that the owner of the Brooklyn Dodgers used to watch the people coming to the games on the weekend and they would be getting off the trolley cars and they'd be dodging around, getting around. So we actually <laughs> renamed the team as the Brooklyn Trolley Dodgers, okay? And it, it hung in there. They eventually became the Brooklyn Dodgers. And then when they moved to LA in 1957, they still retained that name. So if nothing else, in a world of change, the Los Angeles Dodgers is killed still a little uh, echo of the past, okay? Um, Another interesting point is John Cibrele, that was the father, okay? The father was actually very interested in the whole concept of mass transportation. So eventually they went off to the rubber tire industry, but originally they made a lot of investments in streetcars. So it kind of, it, it's kind of, a, kind of a story of, you know, this is where the, the technology was going and eventually he moved away and rubber tires became uh, better uh, after we found uh, gasoline in Pennsylvania. And, and, and the last one I mentioned already, 
you know, Judy Garland and the MGM Studio Chorus, you know, speaks for itself. Um, and this is our latest edition. This is a Bluebird um, um, in service in the 50s on the red line going out to the airport. Um, the person who actually was instrumental, this is Chuck Legree. Chuck actually was instrumental. He's a, uh, um, by trade, an electrical engineer. He got this to work. It probably hadn't worked in about 30 years. It was sitting ever since we have gotten it. He got it to work. We put it out on the tracks um, uh, back in the latter part of August, and that was our first time that we had passengers on it. Oh, so, a month ago. Yeah, a month, a ago. month ago. And I mentioned before the pantograph. This is a, uh, a pantograph of the, it's pantograph, <coughs> not pantograph. And basically what it does is replaces the trolley and it actually provides a, la a larger surface in order for us to get the electric. So it uses the, our same overhead, but it actually um, is in contact with the wire. And we've all, he had to make some modifications to get it up that tall. But um, so it's, it's one of those things that um, here we are, you know, 1965 and then we have 2016 and finally in 2023. So um, one of the things I always say to, to the folks is that every time uh, Walt Stoner, who was the founder, sees people sitting on the trolley car, that brings a smile to his face. That's the dream come true. That's how we started out. So, and we have a lot, lot more to go. It's just labor intensive and you gotta have a lot of money. <laughs> So, that's it. <laughs>